Okay, so welcome again. Um, if you're joining us on YouTube, this is SciFX 104, uh, 100 Meaning is a Foundations course, and four meanings in fourth installment. And don't forget to engage with the video, it really helps our community. Um, and yeah, and if you're here on Zoom, I'm really happy to have you here. This is a really special um, presentation today because it's something that I have been compiling for probably like seven years now. Um, so it might be kind of a lot of information, but hopefully, um, you will be able to digest it. And if you're in here in the Zoom meeting, then we can you know, talk about it, take questions later. Also, if you're in Zoom, please feel free to put your questions in the chat um, so that we can have a record and they can all be addressed. And maybe somebody other than me who's here can actually answer that question for you. And um, yeah, without further ado, I'm gonna actually share my screen and go into PowerPoint presentation. All right, so we have Wednesday, May 13th, 2020, the third eye. So this is a presentation that I actually first gave in um, 2013 as a part of a class called, it was my final project. Um, and I asked if I could do a lecture rather than a paper because I was just swamped with all this writing I wanted to do and I'd much rather do this uh, orally and uh, wanted to be able to, you know, provide group exercises and have sort of that more communal setting to the way I wanted to present this research. And it was for a class um, that was given by the Gallatin Interdisciplinary School or School of Interdisciplinary Study at New York University. Um, the class was called The Seen and Unseen in Science. And it was taught by Professor Matt Stanley. Um, and it was a really fascinating class. It was a lot about history of science. And I was really thankful to be able to sort of bring this topic into it because, I mean, it's so relevant, but it's also one of those kinds of things that in the institutions of science and um, academia is generally, you know, a lot of things until very recently were very frowned upon if they had something to do with like spiritual or religious backgrounds. And the third eye very much, you know, does come from that cultural context. Um, but it does more and more have a lot of um, modern science to substantiate it. And we'll see, I mean, just the difference between when I presented this back then and what I found kind of going back to it now has been just astounding. There's been a lot more of a turnaround in what we see in the general science community. So in the last class, I briefly talked about how the CIA and the FBI have been studying extrasensory perception. And this is something that, you know, we know is true because of this, what we're seeing here is a dossier from, was provided as a courtesy of the Freedom of Information Privacy Act. Um, this is a study that they did in the 60s, I believe. And it's called Extrasensory Perception. So I just wanted to talk about what is in this file because it's extremely interesting. I think it's actually 1957. Okay, so right after, um, well, a lot of things, but um, <laughs> right after, you know, the Area 54 situation, essentially. And what it is, is they found a, sorry, there's, I'm like distracted, there's a chat. Yeah. Yes, Nandini's saying there's so much research info, shamelessly on the internet. Um, it is. It's really all there. And that's what's so funny about this. Um, you just have to dig like slightly deep in order to start getting to the stuff. Anyways. So he, this person, Mr. Foos, claims to have achieved amazing 
results um, and publicity in Richmond, Virginia, because he was uh, teaching a number of people to actually see, who, you know, teaching a number of blind people actually to see. And he was actually teaching them to the point where they would be able to drive a car um, or whether they were blind or if they were blindfolded. And yeah, he, he was starting to do a lot of work with like the universities in the area and starting to gain a lot of traction because he was seeing really good results with his training. So yeah, it says he claims the ability to teach the blind to see in six months to teach a person without eyes to see sufficiently well to drive an automobile safely. He disclaims any supernatural power, not being a scientist or physician, has no technical or, ex or scientific explanation. He merely states, that a person can do what he makes up his mind to do. He claims to have taught not only members of his family, but approximately 25 other individuals as well, including persons completely blind to see with 100% efficiency. Um, so yeah, he brings in his daughter who's 17 years old and who can do some really amazing things um, that you know only like super psychic children uh, in other parts of the world have been proven to be able to do. And um, he, he talks about how it's really just a matter of degree. He said, he claimed that he thought, he taught one of his students to accurately read an article completely obscured by heavy cardboard and that teaching the ability to see beyond a solid masonry wall was merely a matter of degree. So it didn't matter how much um, material was actually obscuring the uh, object from the subject. He could basically teach somebody to see something, you know, that, that was like pretty much any distance or, or obscured by any amount or density of stuff. So, he, yeah, he stressed that it was really crucial that he needed to individually tutor people to do this. Um, and yeah, the, also that it was easier to teach people who could actually like not use their eyes rather than people who could ordinarily see and was blind, were blindfolded or something. It's a little bit more difficult that way. So those are just some key uh, facts that we'll come back around to, which I found to be really interesting. And of course, you know, what the Bureau was observing was that there are unlimited possibilities insofar as law enforcement and counterintelligence. Um, you know, you can see how they were actually intending to invade the privacy <laughs> of, of uh, individuals. Um, complete and, and undetectable access to mail, they say, visual access to buildings, etc. So there are a lot of really interesting implications of what this would be if people were able to do this, um, you know, and back then that was not lost on, on these government officials. Um, there is, you know, a huge plethora of problems when it comes to security and privacy. Um, so there are also, you know, a lot of things that the spiritual traditions that teach extra or, you know, that explain extrasensory perception have, there are ways that they explain this and, and what you are and aren't allowed to do when you have your third eye opened and so forth. So yeah, you, I mean, there hasn't been that much more information released um, from the U.S. government about the psi research that they've been doing, but you can see how they do have interest in this subject. Um, you know, they say they can't afford not to inquire into this matter more fully. So, you know, just something to consider. So what we have here is kind of what I thought would be our most common entry points to this concept of the third eye. Um, we usually are exposed to it through the imagery of Hinduism or Buddhism or something, some kind of descendant of that. 
So on the left here, we have the Trimurti, which is the trinity of um, supreme divine beings in Hinduism. So on the left, you have Brahma. In the middle, you have Vishnu. And on the right, you have Shiva. And you can see that they all have this um, sort of demarcation in the middle of their forehead. And even the four or five heads of Brahma on the side, like each one of those has a third eye. And then you also see in Buddhism, which it's um, debatable whether it's like a part of Hinduism or if Hinduism is part of Buddhism and there's been all this sort of back and forth. Um, some people do believe that um, Gautama Buddha or Shakyamuni Buddha, who, you know, the whole philosophy of Buddhism originates from, was actually one of the most recent incarnations of Vishnu, who was the preserver in Hinduism. So you, that would make it make sense that the Buddha is also constantly depicted as having a third eye. Um, yeah, there's, the, there's a lot of back and forth about that, though, because I, in a lot of ways, like Buddhism was meant to right the wrongs that were seen at, in the ways that Hinduism was practiced at the time of the Buddha. So um, I feel like it was more recently that people started to then say that like the Buddha was, you know, actually absorbed into the canon of of Hinduism and <clears throat> it's, a, it's a really kind of wormhole of research you can do about the history of all these. But um, in any case, they all have their third eyes activated and that's kind of where they're divine beings. And that is how, you know, we get this concept. So this might be familiar to people who live in New York. Um, it's from Shen Yun the performance group. And you see here also, this is just an example of East Asian culture, Chinese culture, where you also see third eye um, being marked here in their costumes. And these are also supposedly divine beings or goddesses. So we see that it's usually, you know, something that is possessed or open in an individual who is more or less divine or in touch with their divinity. So Shen Yun is, it's turned into a meme more or less at this point. Um, something that is very, I think, poorly misunderstood um, because there's so much propaganda around it and they are open on their website. It, it's just, so ubiquitous and so weird there's just like a weird cultish energy to it and people have always been like what is that and like you know some people say see it and then they're blown away and other people are like oh like that's you know a cult or just this weird like you know chinese thing that like there's also this element of xenophobia at least like where from where i'm experiencing it in new york um it just seems alien because there is a very strange energy behind it so on their website, they do um, talk about how they are very inspired by the philosophy and practice of Falun Dafa. So what that is, is a very controversial sort of new religion or cult or um, school of thought that is originated um, by Li Hongju. And he is a basically a Qigong teacher or master. And he started this school of thought in about 1992 and has since been banned from China. I think he lives somewhere in New York now. And, you know, this mode of Qigong has become extremely pre prevalent and extremely popular and also extremely demonized by the Chinese Communist Party. And there's been like 
tons of propaganda back and forth because there's so many millions of followers. Um, they've been persecuted by the Chinese government and, you know, the master and the disciples have all been um, slandered and written about in these hor horrific ways because um, basically like this, the strength of this movement was undermining the power of the Chinese government. And then in return, Falun Dafa practitioners have done a lot of weird stuff as well. Um, kind of, you know, there's there's so much on both sides and it's really hard. I, I even admit, you know, I'm, I don't really have much of a connection to China anymore. I mean, I never really did, even though I'm part Chinese. And I, from what I can, like, what I, from what I've gleaned from people on both sides of this, like, it's really just super hard to know what, what the reality is. But in my experience from the people that I've met or just been around briefly who do practice Falun Dafa, there is a very, um, a profound sense of tranquility. Um, <laughs> in their in their field and i've actually practiced these exercises here and what you can see in i don't know if you can see my cursor but in this particular um stance that the master is doing strengthening divine powers it consists of a bunch of mudras right and sort of these very graceful movements all of it is very very simple um qigong movements um the the way that the hands are situated here it's very much like how you see um here brahma or vishnu or many of the hands in hinduism are you know if it's up like this it's like giving boons or blessings you know these are mudras and hand positions that you see in the icons and statues of religious figures um all over the world so it is, um, in essence, a system of cultivation that can supposedly transform a person from, you know, a mundane existence or an ordinary reality to something much higher, to something much more divine. And he gives an entire history of what alchemy is and what Qigong really is. And so I have read most of his books and I find them actually very interesting, very compelling and also prophetic um, because he tries to sort of take out so much of the um, more superstitious or religious language of what he's doing. And he does take a very similar approach to what I'm doing here, where he just wants to put it in the most simplest terms, in the most um, modern scientific terms to just really like drive his points. Um, so I think it's really important to do what we've been talking about in the first three classes, um, which is to really think critically and remember our, our dialectics. Um, you know, there's, so, there's a lot of distinctions that need to be made between the teachings of, you know, a master and the actions of his disciples um, and you see that in so many different examples the same thing with like the difference between a government and its people you know like not all of us agree with what our government does or the decisions that it makes and you know we can't really be categorized always in the same boat so i would say um try to take it, everything with the grain of salt if you do more research with um, Falun Dafa. I think if you really go to the original text, there is a lot to learn. And if you try these exercises too, um, it's it's a very profound feeling like of chi sensations. Like it will activate your energy body like no other thing I've ever done. And it'll make you really aware. It's like, I think, you know, there are so many different spiritual paths and I think it is really important to try to commit to one as much as you can, but everyone also, you know, has different phases of learning and discovering. And the time that I spent doing these exercises and sticking to the things that he was teaching, I think put me on the fastest track that I've ever been on as far as 
awareness and growing in terms of my um, experiential knowledge of just the different levels of existence and levels of virtue and um, yeah, the ethical points of it too are, are really strong. But it's a very body and mind um, centric practice. And that's actually what I think is really special about it because it's kind of hard to find something like that now where we have Buddhism, you know, mostly focusing on the mental, the philosophical aspects of spirituality and historically Hinduism, um, you know, before the end of the Vedas, like a lot of it was very ritualistic and very like body based. And you have things like Tantra. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of dialectic and I think Falun Dafa does a lot to try to alternate and synthesize both sides of, you know, things like what we call the left hand path in spirituality, which is like a path that is more focused on saving the self. And like I would say Taoism falls into that category. And then the right hand path, which is a path that is more focused on saving others and um, you know, wishing liberation for all sentient beings like we've been talking about in previous classes. Um, yeah, and you see a lot of co con continuity if you actually just look at a few different sources like in Li Hongzhu's books he talks a lot about the Dharma ending period that we live in. And it's very similar to this concept of Kali Yug that we have in Hinduism. You know, this concept that like this cycle of 432,000 years that we're currently in is the time when, um, you know, humans will be most spiritually depraved. And that's constantly what Li Hongzhu is talking about also. This is when the Dharma ends. This is when the spiritual teachings that have already been given to us may no longer apply and there's going to be a new paradigm that kind of needs to be a new direction that needs to be decided in history um so yeah it's really fascinating if you um if you look into it it is definitely kind of dense and it is a really hardcore um mode of study because things do start happening to you to really test your willpower um and the exercises themselves, like they're very like <laughs> relaxing, but they're also extremely hardcore in a way. And th this is what you also find when you start doing martial arts, this fallen standing stance that you see with his arms raised in the middle bottom there. You basically are holding your arms up like this for like a, probably like 20 minutes in like different positions, different, you know, variations of just having them up. And it's just like, actually the most difficult thing i think i've ever done actually it's like so hard to keep my arms up without you know moving or like taking a break and it really puts you in this place of like pushing yourself to go further and i think that's a really really um powerful um practice just because of that so in in falun dafa or falun gong the goal is essentially to try to assimilate as much as possible to the characteristic, the main characteristic of the universe, which is threefold. It consists of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. So when you're doing these exercises and when you're going about your everyday life, sort of integrating the lessons that you get during the yoga or the qigong exercises, you're essentially trying to be in every, in every aspect of your life and every action that you perform with your Yuan Shen, which they call the original primordial spirit. And that is basically your yourself, you know, your higher self, your most ideal, purest self. Um, you want to return to that self, you know, and kind of become less attached to the outer manifestations of this world and the things that are inside of you or attached to you that are hindering or blocking the emanation of that. Yuan Shen. Um, and they also have a very, very detailed description in this philosophy of the inner eye or the mind's eye, which is called Tianlu in Chinese. So that's why I've been talking about um, Falun Dafa. 
because I really love this description. So he says, we believe that opening the inner eye is a matter of bypassing the optic nerve and opening up a channel between the eyebrows that allows the pineal gland to see outward directly. So the medical sciences have discovered through dissection that the frontal portion of the pineal gland has the full structure of the human eye. They take it to be a vestigial eye since it grows inside the skull. Those of us engaged in spiritual practice may have reservations about that interpretation, but whatever the case, the scientists have come to understand that in the center of the cranium, there is an eye. The channel that we open goes precisely to that location. So it's anatomically consistent. And this eye won't present you with the false picture of reality as our normal eyes do. It can see past the appearances of things and affairs to perceive them as they really are. Someone whose inner eye has opened at a high level can see beyond this dimension into other space times and perceive what is invisible to ordinary people. And if the eye is at a level not that high, it may still have powers like the ability to see through walls and into the body. So that kind of harkens back to the, the FBI document that we were looking at before. Um, and the fact that, you know, this person, William Bose, was able to not only do that, but teach it to almost anybody else. Um, because it's something that it actually is not at a very high level of attainment. Like the way that, you know, you, you can basically just, if you try hard enough or if you know the right techniques and if you can sort of scale to the degree of perceiving uh, at that level, it's very possible for anybody to be able to see through walls. <clears throat> and, this, you know, it's consistent with a lot of new age um, ideas about astral travel and you know, the third eye as well, because the, sort of this astral world or plane that's very much, it's not that different from ours and it's not that hard to step into. So to continue, Buddha's thought holds that there are five levels of mastery in this regard, namely mastery of the naked eye, the celestial eye, the wisdom eye, the dharma eye, and the divine eye. These are the five major levels of the inner eye and each is additionally divided into upper, middle, and lower levels. In Taoist thought, there are nine times nine, or 81 levels of spiritual vision. While we will open the inner eye for all of you here, we, don't want, we won't open it to the plane of the celestial eye or below. The reason is that though you have begun spiritual refinement as you sit here, you have only just begun to leave your ordinary self behind and still have many worldly attachments to let go. So that's one thing that's consistent also with what I've been talking about in the other foundations courses, which is that, you know, there's a, there's a very um, important ethical aspect to this and you have to really cultivate to attain a certain level of um, virtue and practice that sort of makes you resonate at a frequency such that you when you open your third eye, you'll be able to see things that are not going to basically tempt you to do stupid things like you you have to be trusted with you won't be given information unless you are trusted with it essentially um and yeah there's so there's a lot of different levels that you can basically see anything in the universe um and you know the amount that you're going to be able to see or the level of information that you're going to be able to receive once you open your third eye is really dependent on, first of all, your master or your guides um, or whoever it is that's teaching you, whether they're in the flesh or not, this is a place where you can connect to the ethers, the main organ of connection between your physical and your etheric selves and also the non-physical entities around you. So the third eye is really more like a tunnel than anything else. It's not, you know, like so much like an eye in the sense that our lateral eyes work. It's not an orb. It's not like a physical, you know, place of any sort. It's actually more of a, a channel that goes like you can see in this image from the front of the eyes from like right above the eyes and on the eyebrow to the back of the 
occipital bone in the back. Um, so the picture from the left is from a book about the third eye. Picture from the right is from a medical um, document that was released in 2014, where they pretty recently discovered that the pineal gland is responsible for determining our sleep wake cycles because it is directly connected through the optic nerve um, to the eyes which are absorbing light and it's it's pretty interesting that this came out the year that i like the year after i did my first um presentation on this and i was talking about how you know lee hongji and other people already knew that the you know the physical eyes are not responsible for creating images in our minds it's actually the pineal gland which receives information from the physical eyes and can also receive information when the physical eyes don't work when that optic chiasm is not um when the optic nerve is not working like we see in the fbi document you can also perceive light uh, through the forehead or through some other organ and also in it's interesting in the book that i talked about last time the body electric they did they did a study that showed that even if people were in complete dark it seems kind of unethical but they did <laughs> they put people in like a bunker with no light for i don't know at least weeks maybe months and try to see how messed up their circadian rhythms would get. And they realized that like, it was also electromagnetically sealed. So there were no um, you know, detectable sources of electromagnetic radiation anywhere for one group. And then for another group, you know, they were still kind of being um, hit by sort of the Earth's electromagnetic field. So in the room where they were cut off from from electromagnetism, that's when those people's, um, when their circadian rhythms really got messed up, but both of them were in darkness. Like they didn't actually get to see the sun and they didn't know, you know, it wasn't, so what basically what it says is that it wasn't the detection of light that made their circadian rhythms go off. It was actually the electromagnetic fields. And we also know that the third eye is an organ of the subtle body. So it's a part of, you know, the chakra system that we were talking about last week and yeah so if you, if you basically like disconnect it from its energetic surroundings that's when you start to have everything out of whack and it's not really just a matter of um physical light the way that this this medical document is talking about but yeah we'll figure it out it's also notable that in, in 1649 um Descartes wrote a lot about the pineal gland and was really sure that it was the seat of the soul because he noticed that it was the only part of the brain that was not symmetrical. It, it didn't you know, consist of two different parts as the only part where it's just like one little organ sitting in the center. And um, I think he also saw what what connects it to the thoughts um and yeah i mean he's been discredited in a lot of ways um but this is one of the earliest connections that in the west were made between this particular gland and sort of any kind of spiritual development or existence so you can see here the the pineal body is this tiny little um tiny little thing that says pb and yeah it's the only part of the brain that doesn't have um, a mirror image to it and this is from a book called the pineal organ by reginald john gladstone in 1939 what this book um <laughs> was is basically a comparative anatomy so he went through every single class of animals and found that most of them pretty much have some kind of pineal organ like a third eye here in this um, extinct mammal-like reptile of south africa 
or you know an ancient type of fossil fish here has also a parietal eye or a median eye some kind of eye some kind of organ that detects light that occurs between the two eyes two regular eyes so there's a parietal spot here in the and this is just like a modern day frog there's also um part where he talks about how there is um, there are granules of pigment that are, are usually surrounding the pineal organ which you know which we know as melanin melanin is also present in our eyes and in the skin of darker people um, it you know it's a dark pigment that absorbs light and so yeah the the pineal body also in most animals has um, this ability to absorb light um which which brings another element to what we had talked about last week about the skin possibly being sort of an electrical conductor um and yeah so Li Hong she says um when people see through their inner eye they make use of not only a primary passageway but also many sub passageways um, Buddhist thought holds that each pore of the body can be an eye, just as Taoist thought believes that each aperture or acupuncture point of the body can be an eye. What they mean that is that this is possible without a kind of altered bodily state brought about by the way, or like a spiritual path, where one can see from anywhere in the body. So this explains why sometimes you, you feel like you might see something with your heart, you might feel the presence of something with, you know, your back. You might feel tingles, you know, somewhere. And just like, there's all kinds of information basically that can travel and imagery and perception that can happen through any part of your energy body. But the sort of central nervous system for all of that, or the central organ, um, where you're you're going to consciously make sense of any of that information is basically located here where we generally perceive the third eye to be so more recently you know we have a better picture of what the pineal gland actually does in you know modern physiology so it does have a lot to do with our sleep cycles but as a driver of melatonin in the body and a driver of the endocrine system which we didn't really know that it did before we used to think it was the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus in the brain that did that but it's actually the pineal gland that also controls reproductive function and sex hormones um, growth and development body temperature blood pressure immune system fertility motor activity cancer and tumor suppression so that means the regeneration of cells like we were talking about with the body of electric body electric last week uh, longevity and anti-aging so this sheds a lot of light on you know all the connections we've been making on between spirituality and life extension um, immortality you know and also how you know the the chakra system and the energy body, it's all connected. And immunity also has a lot to do with that. There's a lot of medical um, benefits to spirituality. Also to be noted, I think, um, yeah, just the metastasis of cells, the metabolic rate of cells, all of that is controlled here in the pineal gland which is also, you know, it coincides with the third eye. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's part of, you know, the area where all of this is coming from. So <clears throat> this is another topic that has a lot of conspiracy theory type stuff around it. And I mean, this entire, like the third eye is really a, a big, big wormhole in the internet that you can go into. Um, but yeah, so sex hormones tend to be um, in their highest production at the, around the age of 13 to 17, right? And this was also the age that, if we remember, Mr. William Fu's daughter, Margaret, was when, when she was able to demonstrate all of these skills. Um, 
that's when we're going through pu puberty, when our cells are sort of at their peak of reproducing and sort of, you know, regenerating and, and creating this like sexual urge and drive within us. And it's also why we have this connection between the Swadhisthana, the second sacral chakra and the third eye. The, the gut brain connection, gut brain access, access also has a lot to do with this. Um, so there's lots of fascinating overlays um, that we can think about. Um, but one big thing to that I actually have come to believe in my travels is that it's really important to decalcify the pineal gland. And after the age of 17 is when, if you look at sort of these more surgical perspectives and comparative anatomy things, um, that's when you start to see that the pineal gland ceases to be supple and because it should be there's like a blood brain barrier there like it needs to be suspended in cerebral spinal fluid and kind of transmitting really important hormones and chemicals um and uh, neurotransmitters you know through the brain into the blood but when it starts to calcify it becomes hard and that barrier becomes less permeable and we essentially start to age and we start to you know everything like in the body starts to malfunction and it you know it seems to me to make a lot of sense i don't really get why people are so dubious about this um because it seems it to me makes perfect sense um calcification of the pineal gland this happens mostly because of calcif calcified um, fluoride that enters through the mouth. If you can see here, the mouth and the pineal gland are extremely close in proximity. And it, the tissue that is between them is extremely soft. Okay, so a lot of chemicals that go through the mouth cavity are definitely you know, in one way or another, reaching the brain and reaching the pineal gland. And it's, it's, it's just proven, like there's just so many places to read this, that um, fluoride, like fluoride is one of the main things that sort of turns into the calcification around the pineal gland. So for me, I think as I've been working on my psychic abilities, et cetera, um, I think I've seen actual improvement from cutting out things like fluoride toothpaste, fluoridated toothpaste, um, drinking water that's less fluoridated. And we're lucky in New York City that we have some of the lowest amounts of fluoride in our water. But if you go to other places in the United States, they fluoride, fluoridated the water sometime in the 60s to, you know, supposedly like prevent cavities and, you know, the dental uh, industry generally tends to hold that fluoride is, you know, important in calcifying the enamel of the teeth um, to create, you know, stronger enamel and to kind of fight against cavities. And, the, you know, it's true. It's, it actually is good for your teeth in that way, but imagine what it's doing to the other tissues in your body. And it, it does, um, you know, make things harder, which is not always the, the best thing, depending on which organ you're talking about. And there are also ways to prevent cavities, like just having good dental hygiene and changing your diet. It's like, I'm just saying this because um, I, my family, I come from a family of dentists and um, I've always kind of hated being treated with fluoride or any kind of, you know, things that I felt, felt were invasive. But um, there, there are ways around using fluoride and a lot of dentistry can actually be avoided. And if, if we really thought about how much sugar we were eating and, you know, if our diets weren't the way that they were, if our food industry wasn't the way that it was, I think people's dental health would be such that we didn't need fluoride in the water. And I think there is another reason why connected to the pineal gland and connected to you know, this organ being such a delicate place and such a spiritual location in the body, the seat of the soul, supposedly. Um, you know, there are reasons regarding that. 
as to why we are fluoridating our water and insisting that people use fluoride toothpaste. Um, and what else? The pineal gland is also um, purported, I mean, it's really weird. You can't find anything anywhere that says that it definitely produces DMT, but it's very much associated with DMT. Um, and it's very active during um, DMT trips, um, whether they are, you know, in, induced via psychedelic administration of DMT or whether they are occurring naturally during like a, a near death experience or an out of body experience. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody's heard of this before. Um, we can have these lifetimes long forays into some you know alternate world alternate dimension and it could just be within like five minutes of our waking life and that's like the time that you were out after doing dmt or ayahuasca or that's the time that you were you know declared dead um during some kind of medical emergency and then you might you know come back um and people report all kinds of really fascinating experiences um, in these states and yeah people say that the relationship between dmt and the pineal gland is that the the chemical structure of dmt is very similar to serotonin and it's able to pass the blood brain barrier unlike serotonin i i I'm, i might be getting some of these details backwards but um, there's a lot there's a lot that you can look at there um, and yeah you also see this kind of compound eye thing like there's just eyes everywhere you know his skin is kind of looking very permeable barely there um, So here we were talking about compound eyes again, um, because you'll see also, let me go back to um, Tathagata Buddha or Siddhartha or Sakyamuni or Gautama Buddha here on the right, often depicted with all these little beads like curls on all over his head. And some people say that, you know, it, you know, it might just look be like the look of some curly hair. But I think that there's generally also another significance to it that has to do with the third eye and some of these more um, advanced uh, developments of the third eye that you can find if you dig pretty deep. Um, so yeah, Li Hongzhu says, a person can also develop a type of eye that resembles a compound eye. A large eye that spans the top half of the face can develop with countless smaller eyes within it. And some divine ones who have reached very high planes have developed so many eyes that they're all throughout their faces. All of these eyes will see via the one larger eye and anything that is willed can be seen. All planes of existence can be seen with one look through this eye. The zoologists and entomologists who research flies have found through microscopy that flies have large eyes that are made up of countless smaller ones. And these are referred to as compound eyes. Something like this may come about when someone achieves an extremely high level of spiritual attainment, but it must be a level far surpassing that of Tathagata. And Tathagata is the um, level that Sakyamuni was said to have attained. Regular people won't be able to see these eyes, however, and nor will the typical practitioner be able to. Everything here will appear as normal, for the eyes are in another dimension. This should offer a sense for what happens when higher levels or other dimensions are broken through to. So yeah, it's really fascinating. And bees also have this type of eye, which you, is part of the book, uh, uh, The Pineal Organ, because you really dissected so many different types of animals and insects. Um, and this is, yeah, just a picture of the anatomy of how these compound eyes work for bees. Um, which are, you know, a really magical species um, and a very alchemical type of being. And I think really, you know, obviously crucial for, for our ecosystem.
and very close to God, honestly. Um, so this is from Awakening the Third Eye, and it's a it's a exercise that I think we can do once we are in our group session. But I'll just say before we end our um, how do I go back? Stop here. Before we end the recording, the book Awakening the Third Eye is probably the best thing I've ever read as far as like actually building the skills and giving a lot of context. So they talk about a lot of the same things that I've been mentioning. Um, the Nadi system from uh, Ayurveda and the Meridian system from uh, Chinese medicine. Um, and a few other things as well. They really have surveyed so many different types of sources and come up with a really nice, really objective uh, system and exercises, like a manual for how to open your third eye. And I really recommend it. It's on that um, page on the SciFX info. It's called Awakening the Third Eye by Samuel Sagan. You can download it. It's searchable. It's got a table of contents with links. Like it's a really, really great PDF. And I found it for free um, from the Claire Vision Institute. And similarly, all of Li Hongzhi's books are free on the internet too. You'll find the link there. So I think that's like a really good um, indicator too of, of how trustworthy um, a source of teaching is. Because honestly, if they're, given what we're talking about with like, trying to be less selfish, trying to be more ethical, trying to be less capitalistic and greedy. You know, if a teacher is offering things for free, it usually means that their intentions are in a bit of a better place, you know, than if they're like charging people tons of money to kind of like breadcrumb them with information. So yeah, the Claire Vision Institute is really cool. Um, Awakening the Third Eye, we will go through, um, this exercise here that has to do with bees, but it talks a lot also about the connection between the larynx and the eyes. So I just wanted to give that tip. I really, really suggest, I'm not going to like, there's so much more that could be said, but um, honestly, the rest is really in that book. Um, and if you really want to, you know, develop yourself in this way, I think that's gonna be more than enough guidance and you can go at your own pace. Um, but it talks a lot about the a throat friction that we do. And like I was saying, the throat is so like anatomically close to where the third eye is. You know, if, if this is the tunnel we're talking about, the throat kind of goes up here. There's a lot that you can do when you're starting to see things um, and open your third eye and have visions, etc., to sort of coagulate the energy there because what we're doing is gaining awareness of our energy body, right? And then letting energy accumulate in this area. And then when you do this throat friction, it's like you can either hum or do like a buzzing sound or do this. And we call it fire breathing in martial arts. <clears throat> it's, um, it's just a way to create a vibration that strengthens the, the, subtle vibrations that are happening and sort of stabilizes whatever images you might be seeing it helps you focus your mind because you know you just have more like a, an auditory point that you can um, focus on so that you you don't get distracted because it can really the things that you will see in that in that astral space are very delicate and um making that sound really helps them to ha take on a little bit more of a dense uh, existence, if that makes sense. So yeah, that's what we're going to go into in the group exercise, and it's called the, the humming of bees. And I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Um, I really recommend reading the stuff that I've provided here for this um, supplemental page. And uh, yeah, let's let's move on. Thank you so much for being here, and don't forget to um, like, share, and subscribe if you're on YouTube, and make that donation if you are able to um, in Zoom. So thank you very much. Let's go.